everybody. Welcome to the Trial Site News podcast series. Thanks for joining in. I'm Dr. Aaron, and today we have Dr. Klossner, who's been on here before. Thank you so much for joining in, Dr. Klossner. I don't. If you want, if we should we call you Dr. K? Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, call me Dr. K. That's what uh, people call me. I used to have a Dr. K website, Ask Dr. K, and oh. it was you know about. 20 years ago when I was in San Francisco to partner public health and it was a very popular kind of sex education website. And, you know, this was when the internet was first coming out and it was amazing, you know, what kind of questions uh, people would ask anonymously of a, you know, sexual health expert. Absolutely. Um, so we're glad to have you here to answer some of the questions. Uh, hopefully we can get through a bunch of them about monkeypox, the current outbreak. So, Basically, to start off, monkeypox isn't a new virus uh, like COVID-19 was. Uh, the first human case was identified in 1970. It's the same family as smallpox. We know it's primarily found in Africa. There was an outbreak before in the U.S. in 2003 uh, that started with rodents that were imported from Ghana to Texas, I believe. Um, but now we have a situation with over 5,000 cases, and we're still counting. And no one thought, really, that... Um, it was going to get to this point. Um, so before we talk about what, what is driving this outbreak, can you tell us more about what monkeypox is, the basics, the symptoms, the progression of symptoms, what we're seeing in this current outbreak? Sure. So monkeypox is a virus and like uh, many viruses, it's spread from skin to skin contact. So you know, other viruses people may be uh, familiar with, like uh, chickenpox or uh, herpes viruses. If someone comes in contact uh, with a sore or a lesion, that sore or lesion has um, active virus in it, and then that can be spread to um, someone else uh, through their skin. And um, maybe a week or two after that uh, event of transmission, contact, then someone can develop uh, fever, uh, sore throat, headache, uh, fatigue, and, you know, feel unwell, like they have a virus when they say, okay, you know, I think I have a, a viral syndrome, I don't feel well. Now, what's unusual about these, you know, pox viruses is after that uh, fever, then these lesions or sores will start to uh, pop up on people's uh, skin. So historically with monkey pox, they could just, you know, pop up um, on the arms or legs um, on the face and they would be red spots and then those red spots would kind of uh, change in a uh, couple of days to fluid filled uh, lesions like blisters and then pus filled um, lesions and then they would open up and they would uh, crust over and the whole process would take about a week or two for the lesions to clear. Uh, what's been unique in, in this uh, current outbreak is that most of the lesions are appearing around the genitals, so uh, around the uh, rectum, around the uh, penis, around the uh, pubic area. And that's what's uh, giving people pause and say, hmm, maybe this is being spread a little bit differently. Maybe it's being spread like a sexually transmitted disease or an STD. Can you talk a little bit about the demographics? Who is most at risk? Uh, who is getting infected the most? Right. So right now from the epidemiology, which is the study of the frequency and distribution of the infection in the population uh, from uh, Europe, uh, the United States, Australia, it's almost exclusively in men. So more than 99% of cases have been in men. Uh, of those cases in men, they've almost exclusively been in people who identify themselves as men who have sex with men, gay men, other men who have sex with men. And within that group, it's been mostly people who have um, an increased number of sexual uh, contacts or sex partners. So in, in one large study, about a third were men who visited commercial sex venues. Um, another substantial proportion were men who attended private sex parties. So on average, um, gay men in Europe and the United States have about three partners a year. So this is affecting people who, you know, may have, you know, three partners a night or three partners a week. It's a very different, you know, subpopulation, even of this small population of men who have sex with men. 
I know from a scientific communications perspective, uh, people were struggling about how to convey the transmission. And I know we're still trying to figure this out, but should we be calling it mostly a sexually transmitted disease or there's also that close contact because you're having sex? Uh, how would how would you say we're transmitting this if, in order to get as many people as possible to protect themselves? All right, so I've been calling it a sexually transmitted disease that it's being spread now through intimate uh, sexual contact. I mean, it can be spread just from, you know, casual uh, skin to skin uh, contact. It can be spread through, um, you know, sharing sheets or towels, but the predominant spread right now is through uh, sexual contact. And, you know, it's important to recognize that. I mean, there's, you know, debate among, you know, the, the purists about, well, is the virus, you know, transmissible from, you know, genital fluids, from, you know, semen, uh, or from, you know, rectal mucosal fluid. Um, that, that's a little bit unknown right now, but, you know, it, it does appear to be, you know, spread through direct sexual contact, which is actually the same way that syphilis is spread. So syphilis is not typically spread through uh, seminal fluid or genital uh, fluids. It's um, spread by the, the, the lesion being on the mucous membrane uh, or the, you know, uh, part of the penis or inside the rectum or inside the vagina or on the cervix or even inside the mouth where there may be lesions and through sexual contact, that's uh, how uh, syphilis is spread. That's apparently the same way now that uh, monkeypox is being spread. I mean, there's definitely historically been, you know, outbreaks, as you mentioned, related to rodents, which was from contact with uh, rodents, maybe, you know, touching those rodents. There's been contact and spread uh, historically in families who have had close personal contact, but it's important to emphasize that now um, the current epidemic is spread through sexual contact, particularly men who have sex with men in multiple partner setting. And that's important because that tells us where we need to target our, our interventions, our prevention communication, our awareness efforts, our educational strategies, our vaccination programs, our treatment programs, and behavioral uh, risk reduction, and to remind people that you know it's an opportunity to protect themselves by reducing attendance at these um, sex events and getting vaccinated. And after people are vaccinated, they can you know safely go back to these types of events. I had uh, on the Causes or Cures podcast. I had Dr. Ogoina on. He runs the uh, Nigerian Infectious Disease Society, and he was talking about the outbreak that started there in 2017 that is ongoing. And it sounds to me like it was similar symptoms and a similar demographic. Um, and he mentioned that he, uh, Nigeria tried to bring it to the attention of the World Health Organization and, um, but nobody really seemed to help them out. Um, but it doesn't seem like this came out of nowhere. Uh, I, like the, the similar outbreak was happening. Is that a fair yeah, I mean, so so typically with these kinds of outbreaks, it'll be simmering in a uh, population, and you know, stay contained within that population, and then you know, there'll be you know, travel, or you know, someone will go into a, a another community, and there'll be you know, a certain kind of mixture of events called a perfect storm. You know, things coming together. Someone is in a particular infectious period. They're in a situation where they don't know they're infectious. They're having lots of contact over a brief amount of time. And then, you know, quickly um, it, it starts to grow. I mean, one, one thing I've been encouraged by, um, if, if it holds up, is that in England right now, their cases peaked um, at, on about July 20th, and they've, you know, steadily come down since. And a big difference with monkeypox and other viruses and other bacteria and protozoa and types of infectious diseases is that once someone recovers from monkeypox, they are immune to repeat infection. And that's why we're able to, you know, eliminate similar viruses like smallpox from planet earth, because once people were immune, they could no longer get infected, whether that be immunity conferred by vaccination or immunity conferred from recovery from infection. 
Um, I wanted to ask, so if a person gets infected, um, they show symptoms, how long does it take a person to heal about the time frame? I think people are interested in knowing that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, um, once they get exposed, maybe one or two weeks later, they'll have this prodrome, fever, sore throat, headache, feeling of fatigue. A few days later, they may start to develop lesions. And, you know, some people can have one or two lesions and that's it. And uh, within a week or two, those lesions will go away. And, you know, for them, it was a mild illness. Some people can have lesions, however, that can be inside the rectum or inside the, the mouth or the back of the throat or on the penis or other, you know, particularly uh, sensitive areas. And other people can have lots of lesions, uh, 10 lesions, 20 lesions, 30 lesions or more. And those individuals will have a more moderate disease course. And there's people who've had severe disease course because uh, they've been unable to eat or swallow. They've been unable to comfortably you know, defecate or urinate and they require pain management. And some people have ended up in the hospital. And now as of today, August 1st, we're aware of three deaths uh, globally um, of people who have uh, died after monkeypox. So um, in you know, very few people, it still can be severe. Majority of people though will have mild or moderate illness. And you know, we expect full recovery at about four weeks. So uh, a full month uh, can take someone for the lesions to uh, completely clear and go away. And how long would a person be contagious for? Or during that period, when are they contagious? Right, so we're, we're still learning a lot about, you know, how monkeypox is spread and when someone is contagious. There's been studies that have shown that the virus can be detected in the saliva studies that show that virus can be detected in uh, rectal specimens. We know that the lesions virus can be detected in. So those lesions are uh, in infectious. So, you know, probably people are infectious right when they first start to develop, develop symptoms. So the fever, sore throat and headache, and that just may be infectious from oral mucosa, salivary, you know, fluids, uh, body fluids at that point. And then once they have lesions, those lesions, um, as they start to um, develop some fluid, the fluid in those lesions is probably what's infectious and people will remain infectious until those lesions are fully uh, dried and healed and covered with normal skin. Okay. Um... Yeah, I was just reading an article about uh, the DNA being detected in semen after somebody recovers. Right. So, the, I mean, many viruses, particularly viruses yeah. that do travel, you know, from the skin through the bloodstream. So um, after someone is infected through, through the skin, the virus will go in the bloodstream. And, you know, part of that virus in the bloodstream is the virus can seed um, seminal fluid and end up in um, semen. And, you know, we don't know, you know, how much DNA is required to transmit infection. There's um, other viruses like hepatitis C virus you can de detect in the semen, but it's at a very low level. So we don't think that, you know, semen is an effective, uh, you know, uh, body fluid for spread of hepatitis C. And we don't know what, what the, you know, infectious amount is for monkeypox, but you know we've been concerned that semen could be a vehicle for infection because you know we've seen cases of men who have had receptive anal sex and they have lesions up up inside the rectum and you know they acquire that you know probably from you know receptive anal intercourse with, with uh, exposure to semen. Um. So we talked a lot about, you know, long COVID's always been in the, the news about these symptoms that persist after you recover from a virus. And uh, I know that happens with a lot of viruses. You have consequences. We just really never called it anything. I don't know if we'd call this long monkey pox. That kind of sounds like a ridiculous name, but <laughs> are there, are there long-term effects that people need to be concerned about once they have monkey pox and recover? Do we know, is it based on the severity of the disease? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer is we don't know yet. I mean, if we think about, you know, um, you know, chicken pox or 
herpes or, you know, people um, who have, you know, uh, shingles, right? I mean, they can have um, after the outbreak and after the lesions, they can have, uh, you know, persistent neurological discomfort, you know, pain, itching, burning um, at the site. So um, I, I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's, you know, a small number of people who still have some persistent, you know, symptoms uh, after the lesions clear, but how long they would truly last and what full recovery will look like. I mean, I think we have to study that and monitor the cases. You know, I would defer to colleagues in Nigeria or other people who've had, you know, a, a, you know, more experience with taking care of patients, uh, you know, months and years later. I know, you know, like with, with, the pe with the people who are lucky enough to survive smallpox, some of them had scarring. Uh, do we know, is that a risk factor at all here? Well, I think, I think scarring at the site, sites of lesions, yes. So, you know, yeah. um, older people, their, their skin tends to, um, you know, not heal as quickly or as effectively at, at younger people. I mean, people who have had children, they know like their child, you know, gets a cut or skins their knee and like a day later it's gone. Older people, the, you know, cuts and bruises tend to persist a lot longer. So the, the skin is not as effective at regenerating, you know, normally healthy skin as quickly or as effectively. So, you know, I might expect that, you know, people can have uh, some persistent scars or some per persistent discoloration or, you know, per persistent effects of lesions. And I think that's, you know, why, you know, many people are concerned. We've seen, you know, images of people with, um, you know, monkey pots lesions um, on the face, um, other, you know, body parts they may be, you know, concerned about, but um, longstanding post infectious you know, manifestations, marks, scars, uh, you know, I would not be surprised if that occurred. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about testing. You were recently quoted in a Washington Post article titled, New Monkeypox Tests Are Needed to Contain the Disease. Uh, in that article, it mentions that the FDA maintains that monkeypox should be detected only by swabbing the lesion. And there was pushback on that amongst uh, infectious disease experts. And they mentioned that there's other ways that we should be testing based on how this virus is presenting. What are your thoughts on that? Um, and are these other tests readily available? Right. Well, and as people know, the FDA is a very conservative organization. So they're only going to opine on the data they have and the data they have in front of them. So the FDA has not been presented with data from testing studies from saliva or testing studies from oral fluid or throat swabs or rectal swabs. So research reports have been published, including one in the New England Journal of Medicine that says, yes, you can detect you know, virus in these other specimen types. But the FDA has not, you know, reviewed those data in a way that the FDA does to, you know, pass its, you know, judgment on that. So the FDA can only say, well, we've only seen, you know, data from lesion specimens, so we can only recommend lesion specimens. But we know the virus can be detectable in, in other body fluids and no test is perfect. So there's also been, you know, um, situations where people's lesions will test uh, negative, what we call a false negative test, but they'll have positive specimens from other, you know, anatomic sites or other, other body parts. So in generally in infectious diseases, when we're trying to diagnose someone with infection, we want to use, you know, multiple tests and we, we don't want to miss someone who is infected. And um, some companies, there's a company here in California called Flow Health. So Flow Health has a CLIA validated uh, commercial saliva test. So um, clinicians can um, ask patients to provide a saliva specimen. They can send this specimen to Flow Health. If it's positive, that is a true positive result. Um, you know, some other people are looking at uh, rectal swab testing as well. Um, in, in some um, you know, men's sexual health programs, uh, rectal and pharyngeal testing is a kind of common way that they get screened on a regular basis for other sexually transmitted 
infection. So it's an acceptable, easy collected uh, specimen type. And if there was, you know, a test that we could do on that, that may be, you know, um, simple and easy to do. And from a disease control perspective, you know, being able to diagnose someone before they develop the lesions, when they have that prodrome of fever, sore throat, headache, fatigue, et cetera, that may be ideal because then you can tell them that they are infected. They can then reduce any potential behavior that might result in uh, further spread of infection. They could potentially go on treatment. And I'm sure we'll start to talk about treatment soon, but there is effective antiviral treatment. They could also get vaccinated. We know what we call post-exposure vaccination will reduce the duration of lesions, duration of symptoms. So there's actually a couple um, strong reasons why having more tests, tests that can identify people earlier in infection may be benefit, beneficial not only for the individual, but for public health. All right, and I'm going to get to treatment. Uh, I'm going to ask about vaccines first, but first I want to uh, run this theory by you that I read about. Um, well, we stopped giving the vaccine, the smallpox vaccine here in the U.S. in 1971, and then once the World Health Organization said there's no more smallpox, we eradicated it from the world, uh, that vaccine was no longer recommended and they stopped giving it. And people said, a theory that I read about was that that halt may have created, um, I guess, a space for monkeypox since the smallpox vaccine uh, protected against monkeypox as well. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, man, that's actually not uh, unreasonable. I mean, as we think about immunity and think about population immunity and herd immunity, right? So, you know, when the entire global population was immunized against smallpox, uh, obviously, you know, smallpox was eradicated from planet Earth, but other viruses that, that um, you know, um, smallpox vaccine protected against, you know, could not effectively enter into the hu human population. So the kind of biology makes sense is that uh, that that's the way things might occur. And then the timing also makes sense. If we say that monkeypox first started to show up in the, you know, 70s. And now, you know, if you look at the epidemiology of who's getting infected, it tends to be younger people, right? I mean, younger people tend to be more sexually active and have more um, sex partners, maybe more engaging in sex at these, you know, events or, you know, parties or multiple, multiple partner settings. Um, so I think there's potential legitimacy, to, you know, to that idea. Um, but I think we, we, we should actually be you know, optimistic about that as it means that, you know, vaccination can be an effective tool to control the spread of uh, infection, particularly in a uh, population right now that's experiencing the outbreak, and that people who recover from infection uh, will be immune. And, you know, at some point through the combination of recovery and vaccination, um, enough of the core group of this, you know, um, subpopulation will be immune and that will, you know, dampen the um, spread of infection and really dampen the ability for the, the, the virus to have sustainable spread of sustainable transmission. Uh, I know smallpox only infected or the only reservoir was humans, but with monkeypox, that's not the case. We know that it can be in rodents and other animals. Do you think that that's something that we need to be concerned about? Well, I mean, um, you know, that that means that it can't be eradicated uh, because there is an animal reservoir. But, you know, if we're adequately protected from infection from that animal reservoir, um, you know, it can go about and do its thing in the uh, animal reservoir, but not, you know, jump into humans. But, you know, it will mean you know, would we have to reconsider, you know, global uh, vaccination? I mean, we might accept, you know, some sporadic cases as we've had over the years, but, you know, vaccinate uh, populations that may be, you know, put at particularly higher risk, right? So like with meningococcal vaccines for meningitis, we target those vaccines sometimes to 
populations that are increased risk for meningitis, for yellow fever vaccines. We target yellow fever specifically to travelers who may be, you know, going to yellow fever endemic countries. So we can probably use vaccines strategically to protect, you know, those who are put at the highest risk. Uh, okay, let's talk about the vaccines now. There are two vaccines, and jump in if I say anything wrong, um, but there, my understanding is that there are two vaccines being used. Uh, is it ACAM 2000? Is that how everyone's saying saying it? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, ACAM, sure. And, okay, <laughs> ACAM and then Genios. Genios, is that the proper? Uh, yeah, Genveos. Okay, now the ACAM one is a replication competent vaccine, uh, let's see, authorized in 2015. It's, and these are both for smallpox. So the Genios was for monkeypox too, but now they're both being used for monkeypox. I believe the ACAM one uh, was granted approval under um, an expanded access investigational new drug um, application or ruling. But the Genios vaccine is a replication deficient vaccine. So can you explain the difference between that replication competent versus replication deficient um, and maybe and why that matters? Sure. So the Genios vaccine is what we call uh, attenuated or weakened live um, that, um, um, vaccine that um, has the virus, but the virus doesn't divide and doesn't create uh, new viruses. And that by presentation of the virus to the immune system, it's essentially you know, giving the um, immune system uh, exposure to the virus without you know, causing serious infection. The immune system can respond, it develops antibodies, B cells, T cells, and then people develop immunity. And the you know, good thing is because it's a non-replicating virus, that um, vaccine that's in the arm uh, you know, cannot be spread to uh, someone else. The uh, concern about the ACAM uh, 2000 is that is a uh, variola um, virus, we, 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 which is a type of virus also that confers immunity to smallpox and monkeypox, but um, it, it has some uh, replication capacity and there's been you know, case reports and events in, the, in these types of vaccine where people can get what they call variola, which is a disseminated, you know, type of uh, severe infection. When you know smallpox was being eradicated, there was you know a very rare, but non-zero frequency of people who would get sick and sometimes die from smallpox vaccination. So you know that's always a big concern for people, even though you know from a public health level, you know one in ten million complications is extremely rare. If you're that one out of 10 million with a complication, that's not going to be, you know, good for that uh, individual. So the Geneos vaccine is considered uh, on that, you know, larger level safer and preferred. And because also um, many people involved in this current outbreak um, are HIV infected and may be immunocompromised due to their HIV infection. If particularly if they have untreated HIV infection, that would put them at you know a little bit increased risk if they were to get the ACAM 2000 vaccine. So um, you know for somewhat healthy, the ACAM 2000 vaccine you know is probably going to be fine. But if you had both vaccines to uh, choose from, you might choose the Geneos vaccine over the ACAM uh, 2000. But from a public health perspective, when we're just thinking about the population health and not necessarily the individual, you know, we will take either vaccine and try to get both vaccines out as quickly as possible to you know, stem the spread because ultimately control of the spread in the population is gonna protect a lot more people than the you know, vaccine. And it, they're both made of vaccinia, is that right? The vaccinia yeah, virus? Yeah, so, so vaccinia is the virus, um, not very well, that vaccinia virus. Vaccinia, yeah, they, but they both start with V, so it, it gets, <laughs> <laughs> but variola was the smallpox. Right, right, uh, so th th this is vaccinia, which is related to- In the same family. In the same family that confers immunity 
to all these two, right? So all these are orthopox viruses, right? So there's like seven orthopox viruses yeah. and they're all so closely related. Uh, the good thing is they confuse, the, the, the bad thing is they confuse infectious disease specialists. The, <laughs> good, the good thing is they all confer <laughs> uh, similar immunity. <laughs> um, and, and so that's a good point for folks out there um, who may be immunocompromised or, or, you know, their friends or family members to know the difference there. And the Genios vaccine, uh, there's two doses given 28 days apart. Is that right? Yeah. So 28 days apart is, is what's been approved and recommended. I mean, right now, the, the goal is to get as many people one vaccine, uh, one shot, and there is um, substantial uh, benefit to someone who's um, sick or to prevent with, with just one shot. But, you know, two shots is recommended and it, it comes down to that, you know, you know, grade school logic question. We, would you rather get, you know, 100 people protected with, you know, one shot that provides 90% protection so then you have 90 people protected or would you rather get you know 50 people with 99 percent protection so then you have you know 49 people protected so you'd rather have more people uh protected maybe with a less efficacious uh intervention and a lot of people were concerned about you know everyone's giving the mrna vaccines too and there was that concern especially in the younger male population with uh pericarditis myopericarditis and i i saw that that could have been a concern with genios or they mention it is that something that people need to be concerned about or should that be on their radar um i think i read somewhere that some folks were suggesting wait uh before if, if they want to get the monkeypox vaccine and then wait a while before you get the mRNA vaccine. But then other people said, no, I was just, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I was wondering if you could offer some clarity on that. Yeah, I mean, in, in someone at risk for monkeypox, a man of sex with men or other gay men uh, with multiple you know, male partners, they need to be getting the monkeypox vaccine. In Los Angeles County, Right now, it's open to people who are on PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. It's open to people who've had an STD diagnosis in the past uh, 12 months, and um, it's going to continue to open for eligibility. In, in terms of, you know, COVID-19, uh, you know, most people have been vaccinated at least once or been infected, and, you know, they, they have immunity either from vaccination or from uh, recovery from infection against severe disease. I mean, if someone you know was unvaccinated against COVID and they were unvaccinated against um, monkeypox, you know, yeah, I would have them wait on the COVID vaccine. And if they're at risk for monkeypox, that seems to be a more immediate threat right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was reading on the, the KFF.org page, Kaiser Family Foundation. They always have a bunch of statistics on there that I, I gather from. And now they said that both vaccines are thought to be at least 85% effective at preventing monkeypox. Then there was a hyperlink to the CDC page, and that also said 85%. Then I had to jump to another page um, because I wanted to see where that 85% came from. Um, and they said, finally, I found it on the WCG Center Watch page um, that it was obtained in a lethal monkeypox virus challenge studies in non-human primates. So my protection, uh, so my question to you is, will this protect people who get it? Is that 85% number reliable? Yeah, I mean, so as, so as you mentioned, you drilled down, you found, okay, well, this was in, you know, primate or monkey studies. So, you know, 85% protection against infection. And then there's probably, you know, additional uh, protection against disease, right? So, you know, the first thing we want to yeah. protect against people is getting, well, dying. And then, you know, from dying of hospitalization and then disease and then in infection. So 85% is, is excellent. And we, we don't know what the added protection would be for, you know, clinical illness or more uh, severe outcomes. But, you know, I think, uh, we have to see in, in, you know, real, real world, real life studies, human studies, kind of what the actual uh, 
protection is. But, you know, I would be encouraged by 85% and feel confident recommending it and, you know, feel confident that um, it would provide protection. I mean, nothing is 100%. Right. And that's why, you know, we're always going to recommend, you know, we call it combination prevention. So vaccination, if you're sexually active with multiple partners, condom use, if, you know, you can reduce the number of partners, if you can avoid for yeah. a short time going to commercial sex establishments or, you know, sex parties, um, you know, you, you should, you know, try to do that until you're vaccinated. Uh, we call harm reduction, which is an approach uh -huh. that says, okay, well, we're not going to focus on people, you know, primarily reducing their exposure. We're going to focus on enable them to be, you know, safer around those exposures. So if you're, you know, a sex party, commercial sex establishment person, and that's who you are and what you do, and that's maybe your livelihood and some, you know, somehow use condoms, yep. you know, and that, you know, protect yourself in that uh, environment. If you, if you can't use condoms and many men can't use condoms because they cannot have a, you know, a sustained erection or, you know, other reasons they can't use condoms, you know, be aware of what the signs and symptoms are and, you know, either get vaccinated or if you can't get vaccinated, be aware and, you know, try to, you know, not have contact with someone with, you know, active lesions. Sometimes obviously it's not particularly practical to, to know that uh, in the moment. So, you know, be aware yourself. And if there are, you know, signs or symptoms, fever, headaches, sore throat, illness, swollen glands. So that's been a big um, factor in a lot of the disease presentations are swollen glands under the throat, swollen lymph nodes in the armpits or around the groin as part of this prodrome you know, seek treatment and increasingly uh, antiviral therapy is available at major medical centers and, at you know, physicians offices, at least in major cities. Okay. Okay. So they will be, if you're in this high risk population, uh, you will be pretty well protected if you get this vaccine. Yes. That's the, and the as summary. you get, you get vaccinated and other people get vaccinated and other people recover, we, we're building up what we call herd immunity. So, you know, it makes it much harder for the virus to find someone who is susceptible that, that slows down the spread in the population. All right, I wanna to jump to antiviral treatments. You were mentioning it before. Um, now I read that there were no available treatments specifically targeting monkeypox, but there are antivirals for smallpox. What is being used? What is being researched? What are people encouraged by? Right. So there's a medication called Tecoviramat, officially known as T-Pox, T-P-O-X-X. -X. It's much easier for people to remember T-Pox. So it's an antiviral. It's what we call a nucleoside analog. So it interferes with the DNA replication. It's essentially like a false DNA building block. So it disrupts the ability of the virus to uh, replicate. It's again been studied in animals and based on its efficacy in animals and the uh, potential emergency nature of smallpox, it was FDA approved for human use. So it was shown to be efficacious in animals, safe in humans, but because these pox viruses are so rare, there's never any big clinical trials to show that it is highly effective in humans. But now uh, we've seen you know, dozens of cases where people have been treated and you know, within one to two days, their symptoms dramatically decrease. So their lesions stop developing. They don't develop any new lesions. Their lesions start to heal. Fever goes away. Their fatigue goes away. They start to feel better very quickly. So you know, that gives us confidence that this medication is uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing. And because we understand how it works biologically, We've seen it work in, in animal, animal models. We put all that different kind of evidence together and say, okay, well, this is, you know, a safe and effective treatment for use in humans. Um, you know, initially uh, it was very difficult to get, somewhat absurd in my opinion. You know, we have the stockpile, but we can't use the stockpile without, you know, 25 different steps and forms and permissions. And, you know, what's the point of a stockpile if it can't use it? Uh, but, you know, they, they did reduce the number of, of forms and documents from dozens to six. And um, 
with, with those six forms, uh, people can get their physician to prescribe them the medication. It's still not, you know, at Walgreens, at CVS, at Rite Aid, it's not widely available. So it's mostly available from health departments or, you know, large medical centers, again, in urban areas. But we're expecting, you know, over the next few days and weeks, the, you know, supply and the distribution of, of that supply to uh, increase uh, further. So right now it's recommended in people with severe disease, so people who, you know, are in severe pain, discomfort, um, may, may need to be hospitalized, people with, you know, severe lesions in, in, in the mouth, um, such that, you know, they can't take in food or, or drink. Also in some people with moderate, um, if they have, you know, lots of lesions that are, you know, progressing, and then people who are immune compromised. So people for, you know, different reasons, their immune system may not be up to controlling the uh, infection. And it's that three groups that um, the T-pox is currently recommended. In. All right, T-pox. So that should be on everybody's radar. Um, and that's the stock, you're saying the stockpiles should be used now. Yeah, that means <laughs> time, it's time to use a stockpile. And people were asking me, me, you know, fire departments, police departments, you know, have drills all the time, right? I mean, mm -hmm. public health need, needs to have drills. We should be practicing distributing the stockpile. We should be practicing getting vaccines out there. I mean, these vaccines were sitting in a warehouse in Denmark, you know, uninspected by FDA for, you know, who knows how long. And, you know, they could not come from Denmark to the United States until the FDA inspected them and, you know, demonstrated that they were, you know, adequate. So we need to be a better job of maintaining public health preparedness. I mean, we haven't not had, you know, fortunately, public health crises um, that often until, until now. And now we've had two public health crises and we found ourselves woefully unprepared. And, you know, uh, in order to be effective responders and to, you know, prevent death and, you know, illness, we need to practice our preparedness. We need to up our game on prevention uh, in general. Um, so, Let's talk about public health emergency. I know the World Health Organization declared monkeypox a global public health emergency. I know New York City declared it a public health emergency. I believe San Francisco did as well. In your opinion, is that the right move? Uh, or do we risk creating widespread panic when there doesn't need to be panic? Something you also have to consider when you're communicating public health messages. Yeah, I mean, I don't think necessarily, you know, a declaration of a public health emergency uh, creates panic. It's how the media plays up that to uh, create the panic and how people, you know, interpret it and then it gets amplified. But I mean, a public health emergency, particularly ones that are, that are declared at the city level, like New York City or county level, San Francisco or state level, like New York, um, has certain... Uh, advantages, you know, from a political perspective in terms of, you know, allowing for um, emergency expenditures, allowing for, you know, immediate um, accelerated contracting with, you know, service providers, um, allowing for certain types of rules to be put in effect or ones that are uh, suspended that can facilitate the uh, local response. My concern, and I've raised this concern publicly, is that a you know public health emergency at the federal level also kicks in uh, certain laws. One of which is that the pathogen, the organism, the germ that you know is the subject of this emergency, takes on a uh, kind of a new life at the FDA, and the FDA by law has to regulate testing. And that would be a terrible thing if the FDA had to regulate testing for monkeypox because the overwhelming majority of our tests available now are regulated through CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act, which is overseen by CMS or the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And once it goes into the FDA, then they have um, many more requirements, many bureaucratic requirements, and there would essentially have to be a pause in testing, and there may not be any you know, FDA authorized tests for weeks and months, which is exactly what we saw with COVID, 
right? So, you know, many parts of the world were able to immediately start testing and have tests widely available. But the United States, there was a prolonged pause where we didn't have COVID testing uh, really at scale to early April of 2020, you know, from the end of January 2020. And that three month delay, you know, caused, um, you know, widespread di di dissemination. And we want to try to prevent that with monkeypox and make sure we have, you know, tests available, tests in the hands of providers and public health. Makes sense. I have two more questions for you. Um, so there's been some pushback between the federal level and state levels that I was reading about. Um, some states are saying they can't meet the vaccine demand. Um, the federal are saying states, you have to help us out. But I know some people are, uh, they can't schedule their second vaccination appointment. It's getting canceled. Who's right? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there, 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 there is a vaccine shortage and, you know, you know, public health is implemented at the state and county level. And that's because, you know, the idea that the, you know, local levels are informed uh, better about what the local priorities are and what the local, you know, population really needs. And I think uh, it's been a good decision to try to get more people their first shot than, you know, fewer people, um, you know, their completed uh, vaccination series. Okay. Last question. In your opinion, what needs to be prioritized to contain this outbreak? Right. So I've, you know, put out there what I call the five point plan, which oh, is okay. um, no, number one, awareness and education. So we have to make sure we're making people aware about uh, monkeypox and educating them about, you know, what it is, how it's spread, what it's not, and how it's not spread. And right now, you know, we know there there's a particular affected community. So that awareness and education has to, you know, go through these community-based organizations that support gay men and other men, men of sex with men, LGBTQIA plus uh, advocacy uh, groups, um, you know, different kind of geographic areas, whether it be, you know, Chelsea in New York and Castro in San Francisco and West Hollywood in Los Angeles, you know, parts of Chicago. I mean, places where people go do outreach to, you know, bars and clubs and venues and all the things that we learned um, that didn't happen early on in the response to AIDS, but then we learned were key in our strategy to, you know, prevent and control the spread of HIV. So partnerships with community-based organizations for awareness and education. Uh, you know, number two is around testing. So we have to, you know, greatly increase the availability to testing. It makes sense to get these, you know, saliva tests or, you know, other types of swab tests out there and, av and available to, you know, pair them with COVID testing sites or other testing sites where people can go and just get a uh, test. I mean, early on in, in the monkeypox disease, it's actually pretty similar to COVID. You can have sore throat, headache, fatigue, um, typically not a cough, but it's not really a respiratory illness, but you can have many of similar symptoms. So if someone who's at risk in terms of because of their sexual behavior is going for a COVID test, ideally that they should be offered a, you know, a monkey pox test um, as well. So after awareness, education, uh, testing, then, then, then you have treatment, right? So we have to make sure that, you know, um, urgent cares and other places where people may uh, go have access to treatment. And we have to disseminate the treatment resources out to places where people go to care. People traditionally don't go to care to, you know, NYU Medical Center or UCLA Medical Center or UCSF Medical Center. They go, you know, to urgent care. They go to, you know, primary care. So we have to get, you know, medication out into community sites where people uh, seek care and seek evaluation. Uh, fourthly, after, you know, awareness, education, testing, treatment, vaccination, and, you know, we're still at a short supply. Uh, people are working hard to, you know, um, improve access to uh, vaccination and to promote uh, vaccination and vaccine uptake. And, you know, we, we should have confidence in the vaccine. The vaccine is safe 
and um, has already shown to have some some clinical benefit. And then lastly, you know, point five is you know, what I call exposure reduction, or you know, not being shy about getting messages out there that you know um, there's certain types of you know sexual activities, sexual exposures, particularly you know multiple partner settings, commercial sex establishments, sex parties that you know people might want to avoid um, until they're vaccinated. It doesn't mean you know that public health is being sex negative, right? It's the same way that you know. Public health informs people, well, there's certain, you know, restaurants or, you know, food chains you need to avoid right now until they get their, you know, act cleaned up or until, you know, the outbreak, you know, goes away. I mean, this is just very honest, open, transparent, realistic communication that uh, I think builds trust by, you know, uh, telling people, um, you know, honestly, what, 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 what kind of risk situations. Um, Keeping it real. Yeah. Keep it real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, there's we all have friends and people that that we love who might be at risk, and we want to make sure that they hear this and are, and protect themselves. Um, so, the real hardcore truth. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Klausner. That was very interesting. I always appreciate you coming on. Um, hopefully, you'll come on again. Thank you for to everybody who tuned in. Hopefully, you learned something, and we will see you next time. All right. Take care, Aaron. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye.